Hi, I'm Katie Mihalik, and today we're talking with Stephen Colburn about his book, The Man from Belize. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Katie. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. No, thank you for having me. This is a privilege and a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm really excited to talk to you about your book and also a little bit about how you became a writer, your writing journey. Can you tell me a little a little more about yourself? The journey to writing was kind of not conventional from the standpoint that it was really more than anything informed by film, not really what you'd call writing per se. I was never what you'd call somebody that kind of like practiced it as a craft through like short stories, poetry, anything like that. My fascination has always been with cinema and storytelling in those kinds of visual terms, I began actually writing screenplays. And it was actually through the advice of a couple of friends who were also fellow writers. They said, you know what, you should really kind of expand your whole format and your craft. Try writing a novel. And the funny thing about it is I fell into the whole world of novel writing, not by design, but I guess you'd say probably sort of by default upon their recommendations. And when I tried it, and wrote The Man from Belize and just conceived the whole story, I really ended up loving it because it's just such a, it's such a different world from the world of uh, screenwriting, which tends to be um, much more, I guess you'd say kind of like a group effort. Whereas when you're writing a novel, it's really all you, you have all the quote unquote creative control. And I'm, I tend to be very detail oriented. And, you know, when you're crafting a screenplay, you have to be very careful how far you go, you know, with those kinds of descriptions. Whereas with a book, you have yeah. total free reign. And I really just, I love that idea of being so, uh, you know, so unrestrained in that, in that manner of, uh, you know, the storytelling itself. Uh, that makes a, a lot of sense to me, especially, you know, coming from someone I, I've, I've written uh, the, in screenplay format, and it is so hard to, at, when you're learning it to not, go crazy, right, with your description. So I completely, yeah. I can see why that would be quite liberating. Absolutely. Um, what had you written before The Man from Belize? I, I don't want to go into numbers, but let's just say I have a very large body of work that's a combination of pilots and actual feature-length screenplays. And I wrote a screenplay called Yucatan. And that script was sort of like a launching pad for, I guess you'd call it, the narrative premise that became the man from Belize. And that particular script was a semi-finalist in a couple of screenplay contests. And so that was the one that upon my friends who are also, as I say, fellow writers reading it recommended to me that, you know, you really should kind of like novelize this and expand it because the world you've created here already lends itself to that. And it also lends itself to a great sort of central character that could sort of like, you know, go on and on for a series of adventures. The semi-convoluted answer to your question is I had written a lot in screenplay. And I mean, between the screenplays and the actual pilots, it's it's close to 30. Wow. And uh, so I really, really had honed kind of like my craft in general before I even approached the novel. Um, have you always wanted to be a writer? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think really a storyteller, a storyteller of sorts. So I've kind of tried to model my journey on kind of the life and career of Michael Crichton, only from the standpoint that Crichton is the only person I know who became a very successful novelist but then he got into filmmaking and he got into filmmaking because he gained a certain degree of notoriety and popularity through his books. So I made a conscious decision that when I conceived of The Man from Belize, I wanted it to kind of lend itself to the world of movies. And God knows, you know, the, the book is definitely inspired by the world of James Bond and Ian Fleming and the Bond novels and the Bond films. Shocking. And then the, the genesis of Belize, like I say, um, was born out of my love of that genre, but then also now infusing it with those, those spy films of that era. 
Okay, I, could, I hear you. Um, I understand that you said the man from Belize was inspired by the script Yucatan, correct? Yes, that's correct. What inspired the script Yucatan? I'm half Latino myself. Um, my mom is Mexican and my mom's side of the family all live in the Yucatan. So actually I, from the age of five, started spending all of my summers and all of my holidays, which is to say Christmas and New Year's, with my family in the Yucatan. So the one thing that people come up to me and say is, you know, this book, it seems like it's so meticulously researched just as far as the area. I mean, I can I can taste the foods, I can I smell the I can smell the air. I can, you know, I can feel, you know, the the tapestry and the walls. I can see the design of the rooms how do you seem to know it like almost like a fly on the wall and now you know the answer to the question is because i spent so much of my own life there to be honest i kind of wanted to fuse my love of the spy genre in cinema and in fiction but also with my love of the country i honestly think that yucatan and the belize and belize are my favorite places in the world. I just absolutely love it. So the book is actually almost kind of a kind of a love letter to that part of the world. That's a really amazing answer that it really comes from your roots. Yeah. Uh, and who you are in, mm -hmm. in your childhood. When you went into writing Yucatan, which you which then becomes um Man for Belize. Book, right. Yeah. Did you know which themes you were going to try to explore? Did you know which themes you were specifically going to hit on? So with The Man from Belize, it was about kind of the exploration of what I would call the duality of man. Because here we have a central character, Kent Sterling, who is a dedicated neurological surgeon by trade, by vocation, but has a very sordid and very sort of... Um, dubious past as a, you know, a covert assassin. So I was fascinated by the idea of exploring the life and the lifestyle of a man who had just as much facility and just as much capability of both saving lives as he does taking lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's absolutely fascinating. So one could argue on the surface, this novel is kind of a throwback, right? To this old testosterone fueled men's adventure novel from the 1970s but it's more progressive in its exploration of the feelings of the men in the story um, and the way the portrayal of women is, right? Let's see, who have more agency in, the, in your novel. Yes, you're, you're, you're absolutely hit the nail on the head. You're 100% right on all counts. Um, I have always been a big believer that, um, you know, I do love the spy fiction and the films in that genre of the past. Hence, there is that feeling that it has that throwback quality, right, to the books and to the films of the 60s and 70s. But you are 100% correct in, in accurately assessing that it is much more progressive. I guess you could say much more 21st century, right, in that you have a protagonist who, normally speaking in this genre, tend not to be so in touch with their feelings and their emotions. And yes, there are roles here for women that are extremely strong. I just as a writer, I'll tell you right now, Katie, in general, as a writer, I don't like writing. And I haven't done this in any of my screenplays, any of my pilots, and God knows, certainly not in my book. I don't like roles for women that are sort of like, you know, passive and decorative. And, you know, they're kind of there, especially in the spy genre, when they tend to sort of be there kind of like as, you know, kind of like arm candy or window dressing. No, my females in this story are very full-blooded. They're very complex. They're very sort of heavily integrated and involved in the whole fabric of the narrative, both in the side of the villains and the protagonists, because by the end of the story, none of these women are the same person who you met in the beginning. So there's mm -hmm. a great sort of growth pattern there in the genesis of their... Uh, their character development as the story progresses. How so, difficult was it to bring that older, more chauvinistic type of story up to date to what we would hope a modern audience would expect? 
not two, because the visual storytelling is steeped more in that classical film and novel that we know of the adventures of the past, but the actual characterizations and the way the plot, the central plot and the subplots are resolved, that is what I think is very modern and progressive. So when um, when Ian Fleming wrote the James Bond novels, he based a lot of the characters on people he knew uh, and even yeah. gave them names, right, of old schoolmates. Are yes. any of the characters in your novel or the names of real people, uh, people that you've known, people that you base these characters on? <laughs> um, yes. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are definitely a few there that are based on... <laughs> Yes, they're, they're okay. It's it's kind of a it's a trifecta of things going on there, and I don't want to. I'm certainly not going to reveal here the who, but I'm sure that the people that have read it, uh, who are you know people from my past, maybe recognize themselves. But to answer your question, it's a combination of a few of the women of my life, women with whom I had relationships in the past good friends in my life who I'm still friends with to this day, and also um, characters in film, archetypal characters in film, uh, actors in movies that played certain roles. So it's a combination of people from my past, men and women alike, coupled with um, certain roles by actors that were portrayed in classical films of that genre. Do you ever get nervous that someone's going to come at you and say, hey, wait a minute? No, because I don't think that I'm doing them a disservice. And I don't think that I'm being, uh, you know, snide or, uh, you know, you know, cynical in my interpretation of them. I actually think that I'm in my own way. I think I'm trying, trying to flatter them a little bit <laughs> sometimes. So, no, I, if if anything, some of the. There are two people specifically that have come to me and said, did that have anything to do with this or was this? And I kind of have almost bashfully said, well, yes, I was, I thought you might pick up on it, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> so no, nothing negative, nothing negative. It's all been very, very positive and people have been, the few that have noticed have been pleased. So, yeah. Well, that leads me to my last question, which is what is next for you as a writer? What's the next novel in the works? Yeah, so the next novel in the works is part two of the Man from Belize trilogy called Sins of the Raven. And it's going to take the Ken Sterling character to a very, very different landscape. Uh, I don't want to give any teasers here, but let's just say that the world I established in the Man from Belize, I'm going to be capsizing entirely in Sins of the Raven. This is kind of good. This is going to be kind of like the undertow. So that by the time we get to book three, it'll feel kind of like almost like the phoenix rising from the ashes like that. So that's what's next. And that's what's going to be uh, explored in Sins of the Raven in the next book. Yeah, that's wonderful, Stephen. Stephen, I'm so excited to see what's coming next, to see the, the next part of the trilogy. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Katie. I had a great time. It's been a real pri privilege and a treat. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Look for Stephen Corbin's new book, The Man from Belize, at henrygraypublishing.com or ask for it at your favorite neighborhood bookstore. Until next time, happy reading, everyone. <laughs>